I took a stroll downtown this evening When I heard music echo through the night So I started running so I wouldn't be too late Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about growth mindset, fixed mindset, and leadership all put into one episode. Because if we look at the beginning of Coaching in Session, we talked about what was the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset type of person. And we understand that having a growth mindset is going to be in a way better than having a fixed mindset because it's going to bring about more growth and abundance and a way of thinking that's going to help us get to our desired place in life. Sometimes people forget how powerful, how wonderful, how amazing they are. Having a reminder sometimes can be just what we need to change our life, to change the way we think and to change the way we move and to change what we kind of push ourselves toward. Because sometimes we might be waking up in the morning and the first thing we do is hit the snooze button when in reality the first thing we should be doing is being thankful, being grateful, and then allowing ourselves to move throughout the day and being present in those moments. Sometimes we can get distracted and it can be difficult to get out of that distraction. But if we can start to be more present and then we look at ourselves not so much as an opponent for other people, just another person, right? The only opponent that we should be having is ourself. But yet we fight the world every single day. And though the world can be very challenging and there's going to be apparent struggles and tribulations that we have to go through every single day, there is a way out of it. And that's just adjusting our mindset, adjusting how we view society. And you can choose to be cordial. You can choose to be combative. Whether you're combative or if you're cordial is going to say a lot to what the next generation is going to be. Maybe we're too prideful. Maybe we're just too in our feelings where we're like, well, I'm not going to change because they're not going to change. Or I have a certain belief and I can't change my belief because that's my identity. Well, rightfully so. It might be your identity. But when and where do we have the right to dictate what other people should be doing with their life, with their mind? And what I do here is I don't tell you what to do with your mind. I offer you an opportunity. So if you want to change your mind, if you want to change your mindset, if you want to bring more abundance in your life, it is right there for you to take, for you to enjoy, for you to relish in for the rest of your life. Many people, even though they're given this opportunity, won't take it. They understand that the opportunity is going to require some type of work and effort. And if people don't have to put in the effort, they won't. If people don't have to put in the work, they won't. The brain is an amazing thing where it can push us to do things that we don't want to or it can see work and troubles and all the problems that we have to face as something that we need to avoid. Well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to change because change is hard. Change is difficult. But if we can be brave enough to change and to be leaders in the sense of what leaders are, and those are going to be people paving the way and creating more leaders. Because our world doesn't need any more followers. We don't need people to believe what we believe. People should have their own right, their own mind. And then as the leader, respect other leaders. Because what they're trying to do, it might be different, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. So we have strayed from where we were once in society. And we're kind of in this path of, all right, well, I'm going to do me. And as long as I'm doing me, then I'm satisfied. But satisfaction doesn't come by simply doing me. It should come by understanding the people around us and then either moving accordingly with them or moving accordingly without them. You don't need people in life to be successful or to be happy. You have to understand yourself. And sometimes we look at people as being our source of happiness, as being our source of reprieve if we had a rough day, when in reality, our state of mind is going to be able to do all that. So getting into our mindset, I wanted to bring on a coach who's going to be multiplying leaders. And in the sense of we need more leaders and not more followers, Ralph Grace Jr. is doing just that. And he's helping the world get into that state of mind to becoming a leader rather than a follower. And not saying that if you're a follower, you're doing anything wrong. It's just that we have an opportunity 
that you have the opportunity to change your whole life around. And the only thing you have to do is adjust your mindset to being a growth mindset and then adjust your status from being a follower to a leader. So let's get into that interview with Ralph Graves Jr. and myself. Welcome Ralph Graves Jr. to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? Man, I'm excited to be here, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on the program, man. Of course. So today I have you as a leadership multiplying coach. Can you please explain that job title and then maybe tell the world what you do and how you help? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that title, it's a its a mouthful for saying that uh, we encourage leaders to multiply themselves instead of just adding multiplication is where it's at. If I can multiply myself in the workforce uh, with my team, then we can all go to new heights together. So it's just leadership multiplication. I used to be a teacher and what I was always trying to do with the students was to make young leaders because I understood those new minds that I was helping create were going to go off into the world and create something that I helped be a part of. And I'm sure the work that you do, helping people become leaders and then helping people get into a certain type of mindset. And today I kind of want to dive down to one of the staple crops of mindset coaching, the staple crops of life coaching. And that's going to be talking about the differences between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset type of person. And then of course, we are going to tie it into how it plays in the role of leaderships. We can start off like, what is your definition of a fixed mindset and a growth mindset type of person? A fixed mindset is this is the way we've always done it. My family has done it this way for years. There's no other perspective and it's just fixed. It's just fixed. We're going to keep running it. Even if it's not working, I'm a football coach, I coach football for 25 years. We're going to run the same play over and over again. Wait a minute, coach, what are we doing? The defense keeps stopping it. That's a fixed mindset. A growth mindset is simply what do we need to do or what do I need to do personally? I have to grow personally before I can lead anybody else to, to move it forward. Mm -hmm. (laughs) to move the gauge forward. What must I do? I may have to change your perspective. I may have to, is there something about me? Is there something about me that's keeping a lid on where we're trying to go and what I'm trying to do? Does forgiveness have to take place? Do I have to change my mind? So a growth mindset is a mindset like water. Mm -hmm. You begin to change and flow and contour all the while, all the while rising to the occasion. So you can lead folks to a better version of themselves. But before you can lead anyone, the first person you must lead is yourself. And I have so many ideas to where the fixed mindset kind of has taken a hold of much of society. Many people in society kind of operate under this fixed mindset where having a growth mindset is a rare commodity nowadays. And I'm not sure if you might have some ideas of why people are more fixed mindset orientated rather than growth mindset orientated. I think it's all of the messaging that we're receiving. We're more connected now than we've ever been. You know, we're hooked to our phones. We're hooked to this. You know, we understand algorithms and echo chambers. And you look at one thing and you're going to be fed tons of that one thing over and over again to where even your mind just becomes fixed and fixated. And you'll say, well, the only way we can stop this is by doing that. And so um, our challenge is are the same, but they're different, you know, as, as in times past. But maybe it's a little more difficult with the challenge because of all of the outside messaging that we're receiving everywhere. And um, it, it'll cause us to either go on a shell or find the group that agrees with us. And we'll stick with that group. And everybody in that group has a fixed mindset. Nobody's growing. You know, social media has played a big role in this. Because if we look at what social media does, you become a follower. So if you're on Instagram, you follow the person. If you're on Twitter, you follow the person. Facebook, you follow the person. Even LinkedIn, you follow the person. It's always you're following someone. And it's not like you're a leader with this person or you unite with this person. It's always follow. So we are given that idea of that follow type of mentality. So we're followers. We kind of lose that leadership type of mentality where many people would rather be followers than lead because leadership takes more effort. And let me say this. I don't believe social media is the enemy. I don't believe it's the devil. I think we've just used it wrong. (laughs) I just think we've used it wrong. And we could go, we could have a whole show on how we use it wrong. But but I, I think we've just been using it wrong. Like you said, man, it's every time you hit something, it's a follow, it's a follow, it's a follow. And next thing you know, you have a follower's mindset. Next thing you know, you know, what you just said occurs. And so although it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the devil himself, it's not completely evil, we've used it wrong. And, and we probably need some coaching on really how to use it right. 
Right. And I'm not saying that social media is bad and people should avoid social media and that they should turn off their cell phones. I believe that people can live exactly how they want, right? If they Mm -hmm. feel like being on a social media website all day and, you know, invigorates them and makes them happy, then go for it. At the same time, you do have to look past that moment and into your future and and really take a good look at your life. And sometimes people fill themselves up with distractions so they don't have to pay attention to the pain that is life and that is their inadequacies because many people try to cover up with busy work instead of looking at their own problems and fixing their own life. Sure, sure. I totally agree. I've been sucked down that rabbit hole on social media, man. I tell you, you get on that TikTok and I'm laughing, I'm laughing, I'm laughing for an hour and a half and got nothing done. So yeah. I have to turn it off <laughs> and I have to move forward. But I, I definitely agree with what you're saying there for sure. And then we get into the idea of social media is not bad. And then we kind of look at how society was moving over the past, let's say, 100 years, right? Yeah. If we look at our grandparents and we will assume that they had that traditional type of role, that aspect mm-hmm. of being traditional, we look at men, how they were like chivalrous how they were upstanding citizens if in the sense of they wear suits, well-groomed. And now if we look at our young men, they're wearing baggy pants, they have their underwear showing, holes mm-hmm. in their clothes. So it's a little bit different. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't go along with the trends and the styles, but correlating our outerwear to our inner self, does that kind of reflect who we become as people? Oh, without a doubt. I Listen, where I, I coach leadership, talk leadership, how you dress speaks for you before you even open your mouth. Let's not ever forget that. We're casual. We're, we're podcasting. We're YouTubing. We're casual. You and I walk in that room. You and I walk in that boardroom. You know, I was a police officer for 20 years. Something called command presence. You get all eyes on me before I open up my mouth and then have something of value to say. So, yeah, how we dress, how we carry ourselves, how we walk, how our, our posture has everything to do with, the, with what's on the inside and what we believe, the confidence we have or the confidence we lack. So, yeah, all that plays a part. All that plays a part. I think what our, what our grandparents... And uh, I know I'm, I'm older than you, so you, your grandparent is probably my father. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so my grandparents, even a little older, they had something, I think, that you and I um, are, are missing out. They, they, they had um, stillness. They could get mm-hmm. to a quiet place. They could get still. They could get in their thoughts. They could get in their journal. They could, they could get into asking themselves the hard questions. You know, today we have to fight for that stillness. We get messages everywhere. Everybody's carrying the phone. Everyone gets a notification all the time. You and I have to fight for the stillness. So I think leadership training and leadership grooming and the way they carry themselves, even their way of thinking was a little bit different because they got a chance to feel that stillness and get alone with their thoughts and have some deep conversations while not looking at the phone because they just got a notification. And that stillness actually brings in the mindfulness because they can really look at their life. They can see what they have, appreciate what we have. And today, I mean, one of the things that has been forgotten is gratitude. Many people just take things for granted. They have a smartphone, they have a house, a car, and it's all taken for granted. We have Ubers now, so no one has to walk or not even take the bus really if they don't want to. They can just take an Uber, it costs a little bit more. And if they don't want to go out to get food, they can have it delivered to their home. For me, I remember growing up, I would walk to my grandmother's house. We could take the bus, but it wasn't too far away. It was maybe like two miles away. So we'd walk. And for me, that was like, okay, that was enjoyable because then sometimes I get to ride my bike. But now it's kind of like if I had to do that now, if I was growing up today, would I do that? And to and if I asked, if I really, truly asked myself that question, the answer would be no. I would probably take the bus, take an Uber, something to get to that location rather than walk. Society has kind of taken the easy road when it comes to living life. You're absolutely right. We seek comfort. But I tell you, man, there's something about that two mile walk. You take that two mile walk now. I mean, you would you would probably discover things about you that, again, that you only discover in that walk that we're not going to discover in that Uber. Because I had time to be alone with myself and my thoughts for two miles. If I took that same walk today, meaning I already experienced it when I was younger and now I'm experiencing it again as I'm an adult, I will remember how far I have grown versus me taking that walk because I didn't have a choice. Now I have cars, I have assets to get to where I need to be. 
yeah. I'm taking that walk and I'm really appreciating, wow, this walk is actually pretty tough. So I can really feel those hills and yeah. I am older. So even when I was younger, I was probably like in my teens and even before that. So I'm going to feel every hill and probably feel every step. And like that walk becomes an experience. That walk turns into a page in your book. We have to live these experiences if we're going to lead. We can't lead above our experience. We can't write above our experience. We can't talk above our experience. I remember, I know we're talking about a walk, man, but I remember uh, I'm, a, I'm a mountain bike rider and I got caught in the rain one day and it was torrential downpour. And I'm back on the trails. I'm trying to get to my car. Yeah, I was soaking wet, but it made for a great journal entry. It made for a great blog. It made for just so many things about that experience, about the trees and the roots and the water. Now, if I had missed all of that, what kind of texture and flavor would have come to my life? I would have missed it. It even helped me in leadership. Yes, there's going to be storms and we're going to get caught in them. But if we keep on the trail, we keep pushing through, we're going to get to our destination. I would have missed all of that. I, I couldn't talk about it, speak about it. I couldn't get on stage and motivate people without that experience of actually living it. But then your mindset during that, though, too, your focus more so on what am I getting out of this versus my life is so terrible. I don't have an umbrella. I'm wet. I'm right, soaked. I'm cold. Right, right. <laughs> so it's just the way we think now. It's totally yeah, different. It is. It is. It is. One thing we are, we can't control what happens, but we can control how we respond. In my book, Unstoppable, I write about the law of control. It's not about the control of other people. It's about controlling how I respond to events that are in my life. Everyone at the sound of my voice, everyone viewing this, you can control your response to anything that happens in your life. And so, and it takes work. It doesn't just, you know, you're not always going to respond correctly, but you are in control of that response and it takes work and it takes maturity and it takes growing. But these are the things that'll make you into a great leader. And what would be your definition of a great leader? Maybe the perfect leader. I know perfect is one of those terms that might be misconstrued being, oh, this person has no faults, but meaning an ideal person that you would want to follow. Someone in the trenches with me, mm -hmm. someone transparent about their strengths and their weaknesses, someone goal oriented, someone who wants to lift the whole team, not just themselves. You know, we've seen that poster that, that, you know, you lead from the back, not from the front. That's what a leader does. Someone in the trenches, someone who understands the human experience, someone compassionate. But at the same time, we have a goal that we're trying to reach together. And it's important to that leader, to that captain, that we all get there together. That's, that's, that's leadership. That's, mm -hmm. that's leadership. That's one of the most difficult things that I had to learn when having my business and having employees was to be an effective leader because mm -hmm. I have strengths and I have weaknesses too. And there's people on my team who are going to be better fit than, yeah. than I am going to be for certain things. I have to understand that just because I'm the boss per se, doesn't mean I'm over anyone where it's right, a sense of right. I'm a tyrant. You're going to do what I say, how I right. want it. And if not, you can get out. The boss, we use the term boss leader. That's just, it's a position. Mm -hmm. If you ever played on sports teams, we all have positions. The boss is the position, but we're all on this team together. And there are other teammates and there are other players. When you sit and, and I'm sure you learned it in your business, they had some ideas you might not even thought of. They might have had some good ideas because we're all on the same team and we're all trying to get there together. And a leadership, a leader will bring out the best in each team player. And that's kind of like where we are as a society where people are so entitled to themselves. People are yeah. so self-endowed to themselves where they want the best for them and they don't care who else suffers as long as they come out on top, as long as they are happy, as long as they are taken care of. So it's kind of like we lost that camaraderie where like, for example, if you and I were on the same team, I'm almost certain we can find a level ground where we can say, okay, what do we need to be successful together versus yeah. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're the problem. You have to figure that out. Like mm -hmm. while we're on the same team, what do we have to do to bring this team to the championship or to the next level? And we can part ways and still be very friendly. But together as a team, this is where we need to go. This is and, and we can get there. You ever notice? And I look at this con I look at the team con concept and, and leadership concept and just about everything. You know, I would watch bands or groups growing up and they were great together. Hit record after hit record after hit record. And then somebody goes off and tries to do it themselves and it just doesn't work. And they may not have gotten along. And I, I watch a lot of the, the unsung or background stuff. They didn't get along 
personally, but what the music that they made together elevated them to a certain status. And so they had to put down differences and let's move this thing forward. And that's what a leader and they understands the team has differences, but let's put those differences down and let's move the gauge forward. I believe people have difficulties today, especially today with someone else having a different viewpoint, a different opinion. Oh. And now it's kind of like, well, if you believe this, I can't be associated with you. I can't be your friends. I can't be your coworker because yeah. you have a different belief than I do. And it's different than how we were once where it's like, you have a different view. Okay. Well, let's have a conversation about it. Well, let's agree to disagree. Now it's kind of like, I'm going to disagree and you're going to either agree with me or we're not going to be friends or we're not going to yeah. be associating yeah. with. So it's kind of like we lost the ability to be cordial with one another. Well, you know, it's um, unfortunately, it's a tribal mentality now that is, you know, we have to be a part of a certain tribe. And if you're not part of my tribe, we can't move, we can't be colleagues. And, and I, I don't use the word friends lightly. I've, I've normalized using colleague. I normalize using associate. Friends means we're actually moving in the same direction. <laughs> we might have some of the same beliefs. We can be on the, on the same team and work together and be colleagues. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily friends, but we are colleagues and we share the same interest in moving this company, moving the team, moving the platform forward. So yeah, it becomes difficult because we're in a very tribal mentality and a very tribal um, age right now. It used to be the U.S. against the world, and now it's the U.S. against the U.S. And so depending on what tribe you're in, and that's why you got to be careful not to tell everybody your tribe. Just listen, we're going to work together on this. Don't worry about my, right. <laughs> my beliefs here and there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Some things you need to keep to yourself, you know, you ain't got to tell everybody everything, you know. Mm -hmm, exactly. And what do you think is the next phase? So we kind of went from being cordial to being more tribal. What do you think is the next phase kind of in the whole scheme of advancement as society moves and evolves? I still think we got a long way to go with this tribal thing, but uh, hopefully I live to see the next stage and you live to see the next stage of getting back to working together, getting back mm. to loving your neighbor as yourself, getting back to serving. Well, people don't understand, and I, and I try to get this through to, to folks that I work with. Jim Rohn said a long time ago, the easiest way to achieve your goals is to help as many people as you can achieve their goals. We lost the serving mentality. The quickest way to get to the level that you aspire to get to is by serving others. Mm -hmm. How can I help you today? Is there anything I can do to help you? Is there, is there, how, how can I help you? You'd be surprised. There's something called the law of reciprocity. Everything you put out there is coming back. The more people you help, you'll be surprised how many more people will help you. Are you familiar with the story of Dan Mailman? He's an Olympic gymnast who was injured in a motorcycle accident, and then he had a kind of go on that road to recovery and then to compete in the Olympics? No, I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Well, during one of the stories, it's a book and a movie. It's called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, the book, and then the movie is called The Peaceful Warrior. In the movie, and similar to in the book, there was a scene or a line where his mentor told him that service is what service is where service takes precedent over our own ideals. So yeah. if, we're, if we're really pushing to provide to others rather than just care for ourselves, we can go so much further. And I think people think that as long as their needs are met, that they're going to be satisfied. If you ask any person who has made an abundance of money and hasn't done anything with gratitude and service, they feel empty once they reach that point. I agree. Another thing too, Michael, I, I don't, there's another mentality that I got to hold you down in order for me to get ahead. No, there is really, when you really understand this, there is no competition. You're your competition. There is no competition for your place in the world because there is something that only you can do. Now, we might do the same thing, but you can only do it in the way you can do. It. So it doesn't pay for me to try to harm you or try to stop you. No, I want to try to elevate you. I want you to, I want to open the door for you. I want to pull you up. I want to elevate you because the world needs you. The world needs you. Any individual listening or watching this, the world needs you to be the best version of yourself. That's why you're here during this time. That, that's why you're here. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. Serving is where it's at. Serving mm -hmm. is where it's at. And the world has transitioned to seeing someone who's on the ground 
who's knocked down, who's having a rough time, we ridicule that person rather than helping them up. And there's yeah. a saying that the only time you should look down on someone is when you're about to help them up. Kind of like we need to get back to that way of living. And then I think that tribunal type of thinking and, and being a part of society and community will start to deteriorate slowly because what's going yeah. to happen is that people are going to realize that this leads to better results because right yeah. now people are just operating in their feelings and their emotions. And what that is causing is them to feel like their values and their identity is being met. And if we right. look at the pillars of development, identity and values are going to be on top. As long as they have that cherry on top, they feel like they're doing or they have some type of sense of, OK, I'm doing the right thing. But they're also not looking at their environment. They're not looking at their behavior and dealing with like their beliefs. The beliefs is kind of where it got kind of skewed. And if we look at just environment, I mean, currently in America, the environment is going to be wishy-washy depending on where you are. I mean, we have high inflation right now. We have higher costs of food, gasoline, you name it, it's probably up. And so now people are struggling. So they have this inner battle within themselves where they're fighting it alone. And they believe in their head there, I have to take care of me. I can't worry about someone else when I'm barely getting by. Yeah, that's the mentality. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's not the right one, but that's the one. I think we get, um, and I'm, I'm going to go a little, little, little deeper. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little deeper than I thought I'd go today. I think we get into this funk or into this belief that gas is going to outprice us or gas is going to reach a level to where I can't afford. Uh, the economy is going to reach. Listen, 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 listen. There is no such thing as lack. There's no such thing as lack. Whatever the price is to be paid, you can find a way to pay the price and live in abundance. But the key is you must be willing to do the work. Like, I, I don't believe that there is lack. You may say, well, Ralph, there's lack all around us. No, I, I think there's poverty mindsets. I really do. I really do. Seeing what I've seen, I, I've, I've seen some people achieve, make multi-million dollars with an eighth grade education, with eighth grade education. I've seen those with double doctorate degrees selling shoes at Dick's Sporting Goods. What's the difference? Mentality. Mentality. The difference is mentality. You got one that says, I barely got out of eighth grade. But this world is so abundant, there is no lack. And so if you apply principles, if you apply universal laws, universal laws are, when I call them universal laws, it's like gravity. Gravity is a universal law. Doesn't care what color you are. Doesn't care about your religion. Don't care where you were born and raised. As long as you respect gravity, you'll be okay. So there's laws like forgiveness. There's laws like, uh, like I mentioned, reciprocity. There's laws like mental equivalency. You learn to operate within these things and operate to, you know, laws of gratitude. You learn to respect them and operate. You, are, you will do better than well because the laws are the laws. And there is no lack to those who really apply them to their lives. I mean, that's just, I've lived it. I've seen it. And, and what we have to, when we see things, we have to start, stop pointing at the other man. If I'm pointing at the other man, like you said, I'm pointing at him to get him some help. I'm pointing at him to, to see how I can serve him in that moment. But I need to be pointing at myself and asking myself, why am I lacking and living in lack the way I'm, I'm, I'm lacking? So mm -hmm. I didn't mean to go that deep today. No, no, no. Like we have to always have a conversation <laughs> and we never know where the conversation is going here in coaching a session. It's kind of like we have a topic before we begin, we talk about it, and then we allow the flow of that conversation to lead us wherever the conversation goes, our mind goes. It kind of went full circle to think about it from talking about fixed mindset, growth mindset to you know having that deep conversation, which is a growth mindset, looking at the growth mindset type of thing where yeah. we can look at money as being abundant or we can look at it as being scarce. And sometimes yeah. people think that success is not for them or that there's not enough success to go around. So yeah. they won't go after that success. They won't go after more money yeah. or they won't go after that promotion or that date or whatever it be, because they feel like they're inadequate. That inadequacy has taken over so many people. And it's kind of like that fear of failure, right? Most yeah. people who have the fear of failure, that's a make-believe fear because when we're born, we're only born with the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. So any other fear that we give ourselves, we are inflicting that upon ourselves. And many people, when it comes to the fear of failure, that is what's going to stop them from success 
from abundance, from happiness. And they yeah. look for a little hole, a little spot in the world where they can feel comfortable, where they can feel that like they can be themselves, where they don't want to push too hard, but they push just enough where they say, okay, I'm doing all I can, even though that's so far from the truth. You're exactly right, man. I have a saying that I tell people, if you say so, whatever you say is so. Mm-hmm. If you say so, if it's lack everywhere, if it's scarcity everywhere, then that's what you're going to experience if you say so. If you look out there and you see abundance everywhere, that will, that will be your experience if you say so. What are some tips that you have for getting in a growth mindset if someone's maybe operating in the fixed mindset realm? Yeah. What are ways that they can be more growth mindset? And it could be small. Like it doesn't have to be like, oh, you have to get a coach or anything and spend all this money on a program. It could be just writing in a journal. Read. As simple as that. If you can read, read. Read a page a day, two pages a day. There's so many phenomenal books that'll get you in the proper mindset. So many. I mean, of course, I got to push mine, but there are other ones too. You know, there's mm-hmm. so many. There's thousands of books. You may say, I don't like to read. I, you know, the, the only difference between a person, matter of fact, there is no difference between a person who won't read and a person who can't read. There's no difference between the two of you. So learn to read. <laughs> read one page a day, two pages a day. But read something that will kind of shift your mindset and motivate you to start moving forward. It's simple as smile. You know, if you smile, even if no one sees it, your mind recognizes your smile. And then it it develops the attitude that you need to have for the rest of the day. I know that sounds corny, but it's the truth. I completely agree with that. When I was in elementary school, I did not like reading. It was because of a lack. I wasn't good at English. I was good at numbers like math and everything. But when it came to English, I just wasn't good at it. So I was self-conscious about reading. And it wasn't until like high school, college, when I started to become more confident in my reading and my writing capabilities, did I enjoy reading. And then I think it was like after college, after all the reading the books and all the papers and essays, it was like, I read, I think like one year, like a hundred books or something like that. Wow. And it was, it was just like, I was in love with it at that yeah. point where yeah. sometimes people think that, oh, I don't like reading. And then that's kind of like what they keep for us. Like if they don't like a certain type of food, well, your taste buds change. And yeah. similar to how our mind changes and evolves as we grow and mature, we have different experiences. So now we yeah. might be operating under a different state of mind, a mindset, because we had some experiences that made us think in a certain way. And people might be thinking of their elementary school self or their younger yeah. self, and yeah. they're not looking at their adult self. So my adult self loves reading. If I could read all day long, I would. But I mean, I can't be reading when I'm talking to clients and things like that. That's just rude. And I'm not going to be paying <laughs> attention. But there's so much knowledge. And Having people like you who wrote a book and then other, you know, wonderful authors, motivational speakers, coaches, entrepreneurs, all of them have different unique stories. And I am 100% certain that if a person reads enough books, they're going to get enough nuggets of wisdom, each of those books, and eventually is going to compile into a huge wealth of knowledge that they're finally going to say, I got it. Yeah. uh, Some of my mentors are men and women I've never met. They've been authors. Mm -hmm. Let these authors mentor you. Everything you experience in life, somebody wrote about it already. Somebody wrote about it. I'm just just being honest. You're not you're not going to live an experience that someone hasn't written about. And one of the things for me, like I think it was in 2000, 2016, where I was reading a lot of personal development books, a lot of growth mindset books. One book didn't do it. Then I read the next book. It didn't do it. But what those books were doing for me, I was compiling a bunch of wealth of data and knowledge. So when I finally got to the book that changed my whole life, someone asked me, what book changed your whole life? I said, this book, I give them the book, right? And they read the book. Oh, it didn't change my life. Well, it's because they didn't have the knowledge beforehand. So we do have to understand that you can read one book and that is going to be better than reading no books, but you should get into the state of mind of reading multiple personal development books. And then you can kind of pick the genre of what you want. Like it could be about being entrepreneurial, starting businesses, and then reading Mm -hmm. those type of books. If that's your flavor, if you like books on charity and helping people read those type of books, and then you're going to see that the stories within those books are not just about charity. It can be about their personal life and their personal growth. And then you can relate that to yourself and to your life. And then you can kind of grow from that. 
I have a rule of thumb, and I, I, let me kind of piggyback on what you said. No, it didn't. You might have read a book that really affected you, and you gave it to them. Their their season of life might not have been right. The situation might not have been right. I read a book through, especially if I really like it. Matter of fact, I have one book I've been reading for twenty years, and and I read it three times a year. I often say you don't you don't really get the meat of the book. This is what I do. I get a book and I'll read it one time. Second time I go through and highlight it and take all my notes. Third time, I really let it speak to me even more. I begin to journal from it. To me, I don't really think you get all the meat of the book until you've been through it two or three times. But one book uh, that changed my life was by a, a mentor, and I'm, I'm a, a fan of his. I got a chance to talk to him. His name is Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. It's called What Makes the Great Great. And I was in my patrol car, and I was a young man, about 25, 26, and it changed my life. Outside of the Bible, of course. You know, mm-hmm. I passed through church, but outside of the Bible, I read What Makes the Great Great by Dennis Kimbrough, and it changed my life. I still read it. I have I have a copy here at the office. I have a copy here at the house. I'm at the house, you know, and so there are some things that speak into you and speak to your life like that. So, you know, if you read through it once, just don't throw it away. You know, let me go back to it. I might have missed something. You never, you get some nuggets out of that thing. I'm, I'm hoping people read my book a couple of times. What's one of the lessons that you learned in that book that you put into Unstoppable? Um, I, I, probably forgiveness, probably forgiveness, uh, understanding what it really was and what it really is, understanding that not only do I have to forgive other people, I have to forgive myself. Understanding that forgiveness doesn't mean I agree with what you did or what happened. Is I'm just saying that it will no longer control me. Mm-hmm. Um, and understanding how, understanding how poisonous unforgiveness is. You know, 99% of the people we're mad at don't know and they don't care. But we're mad at them. We're holding our breath. Unforgiveness is like holding my breath and expecting you to pass out. No, mm-hmm. I'm going to pass that out from, you know, so I had to learn to. So it was, it was a, a big, big, uh, big thing for me, you know, forgiveness and things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love habit was really good too. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's yeah. like anger too. So it's, it's going to be similar to like, if I'm angry at a person or if yeah. I have anger within me, it's hurting me, not them. Yeah. Without a doubt. I believe, listen, anger is an emotion. All emotions were given to us as signals, but not to hold on to. It's that balance though, right? Where it's kind of like, even happiness is one of those things where if you're asked, if you're happy, if I ask, Hey, Ralph, are you happy? You might say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm here with you today. But then if I ask, are you truly happy? You might have to think about it. You might say, well, you know what? Like my back kind of hurts. So, so, you know, I'm feeling a little pain, you know, maybe you're stressed out. You have a bunch of office work that you have to get done. So you're just thinking about that. So you're not being present in the moment. So happiness might be for you at that time just to not have any more work, just to be free and to be still kind of like how our grandparents were. They had that chance to be still where we're living in a world where we're so busy and we don't have that ability sometimes. And and our emotions are roller coasters because we're so connected. We'll get mad at something that happened in Japan where years ago, it took them three weeks to even find out what happened in Japan. We can find out in six seconds. Yeah, Yeah. it's (laughs) it's that overload where, where people just have to sometimes relinquish that ability to be in control of everything because when you're trying to control everything you control nothing and then understanding that you can make a difference even if it's one step at a time if it's helping one person at a time i think we try to make such a big splash or a big impact immediately where we're not appreciating the journey and sometimes the journey starts off slow and it can pick up But everyone is looking for that instant gratification, that fame that, you know, give me my fame immediately. If we're looking at where we are today, it's causing a lot of people a lot of sadness because they're not getting what they want immediately. There's a lot of hard work in between their goal and what they're doing right Right. now. And so many people are going to be unhappy. So that happiness is going to be that goal for them. They're like, well, I'll be happy when, right? So they place contingencies on their happiness. And, you know, for me, that kind of goes into that fixed mindset of like, I'm in this state of mind and I won't be happy until it's changed, until something has changed versus a growth mindset saying what we have around us saying, okay, I enjoy this. And then kind of making adjustments from there. And then you could be more aligned to happiness. I agree. That's good stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like the conversation, you know, like you and I had was about growth, 
fixed mindset, leadership, all of that kind of is the umbrella of mindset and it's going to be the umbrella of growth. Tell people where they can find you. And then of course, like plug your book. I will put all the descriptions in the box below so they can easily check you out. I do believe that they will get something from reading your book. Well, thank you for saying that, man. I really appreciate you saying that. The name of the book is called Unstoppable. Um, you go to my website and get it, Ralph at ralphgravesjr.com. You go to Barnes and Noble and order it anywhere where booksellers are selling books. You can order Unstoppable by RalphGravesJr.com. Seven universal laws that'll change the way that you pursue, that you understand and pursue success. Um, uh, but yeah, everything is found on my website, Ralph at RalphGravesJr.com. Um, they are training sessions. I have free courses you can sign up for. There's paid coaching sessions. There's phone calls. There's paid courses. All those things. You can follow me on Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter, all of the social media platforms that I try to use correctly. <laughs> you can find me out there and I'll be looking forward to uh, developing a relationship with you all in, in any kind of way uh, you need me to. Ralph at RalphGraveJr.com. Mm -hmm. And if you had one thing to say to the audience, to say to someone who's maybe going through a rough time right now, what would that be? If they're going through a rough time, hang in there, persevere, and watch your mouth. And when I say watch your mouth, because if whatever you say, that's what it's going to be. Whatever you say, I'll never get out of this. Well, then that's what it's going to be. <laughs> but I'm going to overcome this. Then that's what it's going to be. So that, that's what I want to say to you. <laughs> All right. Perfect. I want to thank you so much, Ralph Grace Jr. for coming on Coaching in Session. Just the short conversation that we had today was insightful. It was direct to the point, growth mindset, fixed mindset, leadership, and then understanding where we are today as a society, where we could be tomorrow as a society depends on what we do today. And even though we might not make a big impact, even though we might be changing one person at a time, that change is going to be relevant in the whole scheme of things. If everyone can get on the same page, work on having a growth mindset, work on being a leader and not so much of finding enemies into in everyone that we meet. Uh, I've had an awesome time here, man. Thank you for introducing me to your wonderful audience. All right, everyone, I want to thank my guest, Ralph Graves Jr. for coming on Coaching His Session. As you can see, he is a man of wisdom and he has so much training behind the work he does. Check out his website, check out his book, all of the things that he's doing is helping build a better society, helping build a better mind. And though it might just be a chip in the sense of the change that we have to do, continue to chip away and eventually you're going to get to that masterpiece. An artist once said that sometimes a person is going to see just a slate of marble or an empty canvas, yet that artist sees a wonderful picture or a wonderful sculpture. You just have to chip away until you find it. And sometimes in life, we have to do that too, where we're so bound by all the baggage and all the expectations of what we have to accomplish that we forget. We have the opportunity to make any change that we want. And sometimes people are given a hand and they say, this is the hand I was dealt. Well, if you don't like where you are, you can make that change. I've made that change. There was things I was doing in life that I didn't necessarily like. And though, I mean, I was blessed and fortunate, I was able to get an education. You don't need an education to be successful. You can read all of these wonderful books. You can go to the library. That's what I did. I went to the library for hours and hours at end for months for me to finally get my mind shifted into the way I needed it to. And that's looking at how can I be an effective leader? How can I be more growth mindset? How can I start to make changes in my life that is going to have an impact for my future? And it's difficult in the beginning, I completely understand, because change is difficult. Change is going to be challenging for the brain. But you do have to get into that understanding and you have to, to figure out how you can coax yourself to slowly make those adjustments. And it doesn't have to be overnight. You can start small. And then once you figure out what steps you need to start small, then you can start to chip away. And then eventually you can get to that masterpiece or that piece of art that was hidden, that was hidden in the marble or that was invisible on the canvas. We have to be able to see what we're doing in life and then go after it. And then if you're having a hard time, of course, get a coach, a mentor, a guide. And Ralph said it best, a book 
can be your mentor and author from that book. They might not be around anymore, but those words of wisdom that that author instilled into those pages are there for your reading pleasure and for your growth. So understand that you don't have to pay. You don't have to get a coach. You can do everything by yourself. It's just a lot quicker when you have someone looking at what you're doing, being able to see your blind spots because Most coaches do have experiences with many types of people in many different types of scenarios and situations. So they can look at your situation and not saying that your situation is going to be the same as everyone else's, it's going to be similar. And then we can offer you guidance to help you get into that better state of mind quicker rather than you having to do a bunch of trial and error. For me, I did it by myself. I did years and years of trial and error. And if I look back, if I had a coach, I would have been there twice as fast. And it wasn't until I started my business where I was like, I need a coach. Because not only do I believe in coaching, I understand the value of coaching and understand the value of having people work together under one goal, one mission, and that's going to be whatever you want. So ask yourself, what do you want in your life? Do you have it? Most people have something that they desire and it doesn't have to be material doesn't have to be monetary. It could be peace. It could be stillness. It could be happiness. So whatever you're looking for, look for someone who can help you get there. Gather a team. Unite with people. And not so much in the sense of being tribal and finding people who are like-minded because you might be in a group of like-minded people and they're all fixed mindset. So find people who are going to help you and elevate you and not be anchors in your life. There's so much more to living than just waking up every single day and going to work. Find your meaning, find your purpose, find your passion, and then go after it with everything you have. Also, I encourage everyone to check out Ralph Graves Jr.'s links below. Check out his book again. Check out his website. See what he has to offer. And then make your choice, right? Do you want to stay where we are or do you want to elevate? And I hope you choose to elevate, whether it be with me, with Ralph, with any type of book understand you're in charge. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coachingaccession at gmail.com. I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching Accession. Until then, everyone take care.